Engineers at the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant have identified why the number three reactor experienced a meltdown after the 2011 disaster. They say the accident likely resulted from the early breakdown of the cooling system and failed attempts to inject water. The plant's number one, two, and three reactors suffered meltdowns. At reactor number three, the meltdown began at about 10.40 a.m. on March 13th, two days after the quake and tsunami. Engineers with Tokyo Electric Power Company say the latest findings suggest that part of the fuel was exposed because the water level inside the reactor was too low. This indicates the functions of the emergency cooling system had already been lost by early morning. Their report also says firefighters began to douse the reactors with water shortly after 9 a.m. They say that may have been ineffective effective because of leaks from the piping. TEPCO officials say they will continue to investigate why massive amounts of radioactive substances were released and how it happened. The cleanup from the 2011 nuclear accident is making headway, but now places need to be found where the radioactive waste can be temporarily stored. So the Japanese government has asked communities near the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant to host storage facilities. Environment Minister Nobuteru Ishihara and Reconstruction Minister Takumi Nemoto visited Fukushima Prefecture. They asked Governor Yuhei Sato and the mayors of three towns, Futaba, Okuma, and Naraha, to accept the facilities. The storage sites would be used to hold radioactive soil and debris collected from decontamination work for up to 30 years. The ministers say the government would legislate its pledge to remove the waste out of the prefecture for permanent disposal if the communities agree to host the facilities. The government plans to acquire 19 square kilometers in three towns and then nationalize the land. It would start bringing waste to the facilities by January 2015, after it obtains the consent of local landowners. But local opposition is strong. Residents say they don't want to give up land that has been handed down to them from their ancestors. The residents say the facilities could also discourage evacuees from returning to their hometowns. The government must achieve accountability and earn the residents' understanding. We must firstly care about the residents' opinions so that we can create an environment where they can accept the plan as soon as possible. The central government plans to hold briefings for residents next year to convince them of the need to build the facilities. By a giant tsunami in 2011. The hundreds of thousands forced to flee literally saw their lives washed away. Promises were made that it would only be a matter of time before their homes were rebuilt. But as RT's Alexei Yereshevsky found out, those people are still waiting. This woman can only fit me and my cameraman into her new home. She apologizes, but there's simply no room for the whole crew inside. She's one of resettlers from the Fukushima area, forced to leave their homes amid the 2011 nuclear disaster. When the tsunami hit, we were told to pack only necessary things and run away. They said it would be only for two, three days. Now, living in this cage of a house, returning to our old house is a dream, which we know won't ever come true. We are being fed with promises of a bigger house, but that's as far as it gets, promises. This is just one of the quickly erected residential areas where Fukushima exiles have relocated to. There are hundreds of makeshift camps scattered across the region, accommodating more than 300,000 people. 
All of the 400 resettlers living in this particular area used to have large houses before the Fukushima accident. Now they're forced to live in this 30 square meter dwellings. They were told that this would be just a short term measure, but it seems in their case, the old saying, there's nothing more permanent than temporary, suits very well. The majority of these people are pensioners suffering from different ailments. They are jobless, just as surprisingly many of their younger neighbors. This man used to run a profitable venture. Now he barely makes ends meet. I had a $100,000 a year business producing honey. Now it's destroyed forever, just like my life. On top of all that, I'm offered neither financial compensation nor any job. That's why I'm taking TEPCO to court. The government says it's working on improving conditions for resettlers, but with the Fukushima clear-up draining billions of dollars out of the state budget, it could take years, maybe even a decade, to do that. Even local officials are being kept in the dark. The government says it's building bigger houses, but will finish it in no sooner than two years. And not all of these people will be able to live in those. That's as little as we, officials on the ground, are told by the central government. Fukushima means a happy island in Japanese. But that's the last word these people would ascribe to their lives, which are unlikely to ever return to normal, especially with the government admitting the area around the nuclear site might never again be suitable to live in. Alexei Roshevsky, RT, reporting from Japan. The industry is taking a step into the future thanks to the Department of Energy. Local News 8's Bree Clark joining us in the studio with more. Bree, the INL is going to have a lot to do with this, right? That's right. The Department of Energy has given a company called New Scale a grant for a smaller, more efficient nuclear reactor. But the INL could be giving them a place to set up shop. When you think of a nuclear power plant, you think of this huge dome that takes up all the space in the world. But New Scale is shaking the nuclear industry with a new concept. We don't have all of those vessels and pumps and motors and valves to make our plant work. We rely on three things. Those three things are convection, conduction, and gravity through a natural circulation process of water and heat. As long as those three things work, our plant will work, and it will always safely operate, and it will always safely shut down. And with anything this innovative, there has to be stakeholders, like the Utah Associated Municipal Power System, which Idaho Falls Power is a part of. We believe we've got um, great expertise in Idaho Falls to be, you know, hopefully part of any conversation of deployment of that new technology. Um, and so, you know, we just look forward to continuing to um, understand what role we can play in, in investigating and monitoring development of small modular reactors. A fairly great concept, but will it help our economy? Grotto Falls Incorporated sure thinks so. It's a great opportunity, not just for Idaho Falls, but all of eastern Idaho. Um, there are you know, opportunities for the lab, there are commercial opportunities, and apparently New Scale is the only uh, U.S.-based company that was uh, established primarily for the commercialization of small modular reactors. Which translates into more jobs. If we could welcome them to eastern Idaho, I think that that would have a far-reaching economic positive impact. Once New Steel has passed their designing phase and are ready to build a facility, they estimate around 1,000 jobs will be added to East Idaho's workforce. Live in the studio, I'm Brie Clark. It's not going to hurt our feelings.
Yeah, no, not at all. Thanks, Bree. The company estimates completion of the new reactor along with facility by the year 2013. No, 2023. Oh, 20, 2023. 2023. This is yeah. 2013. I yeah. got that. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish we could have it tomorrow. That'd be a great right. Christmas present. Ten present. years from now. Yeah. And, you know, this this is the place where you see a lot of that kind of innovation, of course. Oh. You know, the first nuclear lit town was, yes. was in Arco there. Yep, the most brilliant minds in the world live right here in eastern Idaho. So. It's a good place.